It's Red Eye Radio. Gary McNamara and Eric Harley talk about everything from politics to social issues and news of the day. Whether you're up late or you're just starting your day, welcome to the show from the Uniden America Studios. This is Red Eye Radio. Hello and welcome. He is Gary McNamara. I'm Eric Harley as we begin a Thursday. Gary, good morning. Hey, sorry, microphone wasn't on. (laughs) Hello! (laughs) I'm just sitting here reading through stuff and just just headlines. Mm. Uh, And the headlines themselves are great. I mean, we're going to cover everything, but the the, the headlines, just reading some of the headlines. Mm -hmm. Trump offers advice to Ramaswamy. Be a little careful about what you say so you're not controversial. I'm sorry, I thought you said Trump offered that advice. Uh, Trump offered that advice. To be clear, Donald Trump or Eric Trump? <laughs> Donald, Donald, Donald Trump. Okay. All right. I just, I just want to clarify things. <laughs> the, 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 this this uh, other headline. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Taylor Lorenz calls Dylan Mulvaney guest of honor at a party hosted by Kathy Griffin. Uh, that uh, uh, apparently that Rosie O'Donnell was also at, <laughs> called her one of the most beautiful and brave women on the planet. Mm. And the Breitbart headline beneath it is, Worst Party of All Time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. So my problem is I can't even get through the headlines. I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Kathy Griffin. Uh, well, well, there, th- that's right there. That's where the party stops. That's where the fun ends. Oh, Kathy's here. Oh, right. <laughs> I mean, I just <laughs> okay. And to hmm. back up, uh. Eric's statement that everybody is high. Apparently, they are at the U.S. Open tennis tournament. <laughs> Another player backs the claim of marijuana smell on at court 17. Smells like Snoop Dogg's living room. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. We don't even have to get into the minutia of any articles. All I have to do is sit here and just read the headlines. Yeah. We're ahead. We're Red Eye Headline Talk Radio. Yeah. That's all we're going to do, just read the headlines. I remember a buddy of mine went to a baseball game out in San Francisco, and this goes back several years. I think it was before legal uh, recreational. I think it was still medical at that point, but he said he walked up close to the ballpark, and then all of a sudden it's just wafting. He said, I don't know if it was like everybody in the cheap seats was was smoking weed, but it was it was a lot. It wasn't like walking past one person sitting on a bench or in a seat. He said it was it was like being you know, when we were young you go to a show, you got a concert. A program where the rock and roll musicians would demonstrate their skills. And then all of a sudden, quite often, I guess depending on the artist, you'd start smelling it. It's like, oh, man, here we go. And I was with a friend of mine, Wade. We were watching Golden Earring open up for Rush in San Antonio, Texas. And I remember Wade looking at me going, because Wade was on his way to joining the military after high school. He already knew that at the time. Now, we weren't, he wasn't a senior or anything. It wasn't like months before he was going to enter the military. But he always had that mindset of, look, I've got to make sure that everything is, you know, my school, you know, I don't want any discipline item, disciplinary items or anything on my record. I want to have make sure everything's going to be good. You know, he was he was a great musician uh, as well. And I remember all of a sudden the smell. And it's like, you know, somewhere around us. Mm-hmm. And 
it was always said, I never experienced this, but it was always said, and I think in a couple of movies, they demonstrated that people would just pass it around, like to anybody in the audience. You know, they oh, would just, yeah. whoever brought it, you just yeah. started passing it around. It was never passed on to me, but that was probably because I was very young at the time. I was, uh, I would have been 15. Well, it was, uh, you know, one of the reasons that rock concerts are so expensive today is because these uh, rock bands actually have to go out and get fog machines. Yeah. Back in the 70s, when I started going to rock concerts, indoors you didn't need any fog machines <laughs> because no, in fact they, they, because sm- number one cigarette smoking was legal right inside the buildings right and so you would be in these arenas that would be that uh you know would fit eighteen thousand people and you'd get in there and by the time the concert started there'd be a fog throughout the entire place yeah and a combination of tobacco mm. and and pot smell and i remember uh, going to the when uh, we I used to go to a lot of NBA games when Buffalo had the Buffalo Braves. I remember the Boston Celtics coming in. Mm. Tommy Heinsohn would smoke the the old coach of the Boston Celtics would smoke right there on the bench. Yeah, and so you could do it, but 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 yeah, it would be when you used to walk in, it would be hanging over. I just would figure that at a tennis match, you know, they'd be vaping. I just you know I figured they would be beyond actually smoking pot. That it would be vaping or edibles or something like that. That they're a much more sophisticated pot crowd. <laughs> like well, that. a sophisticated pot crowd. <laughs> that, see, that statement's pretty funny. <laughs> I I don't know what the uh, what the rules are, what the regulations are of you know in a venue like that in the areas where they have it where it's legal. I don't know what those. I don't know what the local rules are. You know, can you smoke it in that venue? I, I, it's my understanding that no, you, you really no, can't no. do that in some, no. in a venue. No, in other areas, you might be able to in the, in the open, but you know, you can't, no. you can't really take it into yeah, a venue. Not in most public places. You, you can't, I remember when, when I used to go to a lot of bills games, when I had my season tickets and everything else, there used to be a section of the stadium that, which is soon going to be the old stadium. Mm-hmm. But, uh, there were like, you know, they had ramps going up and down. There'd be grassy areas that would sort of be on an angle, you know, yeah. maybe a 20 degree angle going up, maybe about, you know, 30 feet connecting one concourse to another concourse. And there was one place and it was known that's where everybody went to get high during at halftime or at the beginning of the game. And I mean, it was, you'd walk, you'd get within a <laughs> hundred yards of it. And you go, Oh, wow. And everybody, you had hundreds of people, and the cops finally, this is going back to the, oh, probably somewhere in the early 90s, I think it was, when they finally broke that up. And they just said, you can't you can't do it anymore. But no, I don't, I don't think in most places you can smoke publicly the major- in, in, an, yeah. in an arena. The, uh, th- this is from greenstate.com. <laughs> I want to know more about that website. <laughs> we're, we're not <laughs> the, talking... We're not talking uh, ecological things, are we? We're not talking renewable energy here. Okay, all right. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) The majority of legal states ban any consumption in public places, uh, relegating consumption to a private residence. People who live in government-subsidized housing um, can um, consume in their home, you know, even though it's... And and, jo- I, that's, and I, that's not always government and Joe Rogan studio. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> apparently, <laughs> yes, allegedly and apparently, <laughs> where it's not legal in Texas. It was when he was in California. It's not legal right. in our state. That's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. And finally, the the last headline I just made me laugh, even though it is true. Joe Biden's terrible, horrible, no good, very bad month. <laughs> you know, I didn't I didn't like encapsulate it. I didn't put it into like a month as we here, you know, just begin our final day of August. I didn't really think about it in that way because it's always bad in my in my mind it's always bad. It's just getting progressively worse. So, I guess the next question is this bad month going to turn into just again this downward spiral? Tell me where it improves for Joe Biden. 
Tell me where Joe Biden is going to be in any setting, lucid, able to answer questions, not defiant. Oh, by the way, and, and stating that, uh, Mitch McConnell needs to step down. It's, listen, to, to, to I don't show, know what's to, going on with him, but right. it's, it's yeah, this, this, this can't be because, and, and I understand, you know, there's a delicate balance in the Senate and everything else. Yeah, no, I get that. But there's going to be, because of the law of Kentucky, uh, it, it's going to, they passed a law. Uh, it will be, the governor will, it, it doesn't matter that the governor tried to veto that law, by the way, lawmakers in that state passed the law, I think it was in 21. It will be a Republican that replaces them if he steps down now. Well, no, that no, was I, the question. I mean step down as speaker, not as a congressperson. You mean as as, as, as Excuse leader? me, not the speaker. Good God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hold, hold it. Take two yeah. uh, as minority leader. Yeah. He, um, he, he, well, he, if, he's yeah, stepped but, well, I time. guess the, everybody's wondering if, I mean, the ultimate question is what happens if he's not there at all? If he decides to just, if he yeah. has to step yeah. down, uh, you know, if he's, you know, if he becomes ill, what happens? The governor, it, it doesn't matter, uh, you know, the law in that state, either way, it's going to be a Republican. Now, there was rumor going around back in 21 that they were grooming a couple of candidates to run for that seat in the future. I, I don't know anything about that, but it would be a Republican. So the balance of the Senate wouldn't change. Yeah, I I, I was specifically. But since I mentioned the speaker, he can step down, too. Uh, no, no. <laughs> I just I actually I don't believe he should yet. I believe that would be the wrong thing to do right now. But I do that. You know, yeah. I know yeah. there are people that hate, uh, ma, you know, McCarthy. I don't you know, I think he's done an OK job. Not stellar, but I think he's done. Yeah. The, okay. Yeah. The total score isn't in yet, I guess. Yeah. You know, it's it's. Um, yeah, we're not to halftime yet. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Let's get the game over <laughs> and then. You know, decide if he's going to be able to lead. No, but 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 to show that you know, when we we look at the cognitive abilities, my father is ninety seven, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and he's not close to being. He can answer. He may ask again, "What did you know? What did you say?" But that's more of his hearing mm-hmm. than his cognitive abilities. Mm-hmm. But um, I don't know. I I don't know what's wrong with Joe Biden. I don't know what's wrong with Mitch McConnell. But uh, you can't have. As the minority leader of the Republicans, you can't have that. No, you can't. He, and he cannot. He cannot be doing that. And um, you know, and and so as to whether he stays a congressperson or not, that's a different story. But as leader of the Republicans in the Senate, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. he needs to step down. Yeah, and you know, look again. I'm not sure what's going on with him. It it I it, it seems it's related to the incident that he had. He uh, suffered a concussion. Uh, with that fall uh, a few months ago, and it, it, we're in a situation where that's happened a couple of times now, where he was talking to the media. So the question is: Is it happening happening more often on you know just on a daily basis when the camera's not on him? And the fact of the matter is, is that there's something very serious going on, and the focus should be his health. Yeah, and and also. Uh, The citizens are going to have to have someone who can focus on the issues at hand in the Senate in that position. Yeah. uh, In a, I I think you need, you need new blood in there. You just need new, you need more energetic blood. You just, you just do an age. Well, you're, you're practicing ageism. Yeah. Because age causes problems. Yeah. Causes cognitive problems. That's just the reality of age. Yeah. We're, not, we're not talking about somebody 50 years old, right. uh, you know, being forced to remove, be, you know, from their, even though ageism really is probably for the most part gone in the workplace, isn't it? What? Yeah. You're, no, I mean, you're 70 and well, you, you seem to be pretty smart. Will you show up every day? Yeah, Have exactly. You, well, what do you mean show up every day? I've shown up every day. I've never been late yeah. and hardly ever taken a, a sick day. Yeah. Well. So you want to work from home in your bed, right? No, I'll actually drive to the place of business. You're hired. Yes, exactly. You know, I mean, it's, you know, we're, but I agree with you. Uh, You look at, at, uh, you know, in the House, Byron Donalds, you look at at a number of Republicans who have come in who are doing a really good job. Uh, Ramaswamy, you know, I don't think he's going to be the nominee. He could run for office, though. He could run for Senate. He could run. 
yeah. for House. He could run, you know, uh, for another office. I think he has a future in, in American politics if he wants it. Um, but those that what the I, I guess what it requires if conservatives are going to get the message out, they're going to have to have people that are capable of doing that. And that's, you know, that's it. I mean, there is that's just the the end of it. And we we seem to have this stagnant water on Capitol Hill on the right. Eight six six ninety red eye. How much do you know about synthetic oil? Heavy duty trucks have been running on traditional mineral oil for the last 100 years. But today's technology brings us other options to consider. Synthetic is better quality. Unlike conventional oil, synthetic oils have a consistent molecular structure, giving it the ability to support pressures from higher horsepower engines, especially at lower RPMs. It also allows oil to reduce friction in an engine, controlling temperatures and improving fuel economy. Lastly, they're cleaner. Synthetics pick up fewer contaminants as they do their job of lubrication. They also have a better oxidation stability, resulting in an overall cleaner engine. This report is brought to you by Shell Rotella. Shell Rotella, with advanced synthetic technology, is designed to help keep your rig running with more mileage and less maintenance. Lines open for your calls. 866-90-RED-EYE on Red Eye Radio. Red Eye Radio, and so we were just looking at some of the headlines, funny headlines out there, hmm. and and I just saw one of the funny fake headlines from the Babylon Bee. You ready? All right. <laughs> I don't know if I can get this one out. <laughs> <laughs> Biden comforts hurricane victims by talking about the time the urinal splashed back at him a little. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's no way he can't make it about him. Uh, no, I mean that's what he that's what he did in Maui. He does it every single time. Because the if you're if you actually uh empathize if you actually are grieving with the people in a thoughtful way with with the individuals there, if you actually feel their suffering then you can't relate. Most likely, you can't relate to it. Well, sometimes a few people, you know, you've, you might come across someone who, who, you know, I've I've been here before and I want to help you go through this or whatever. But in something in that setting, it's likely the case that you there's nothing you can you can't possibly imagine what they're going through. Well, think about this. Think about the wildfires. I, I started thinking about what what must have been like because the wildfires in Maui hit so quickly because of the wind. And I'm thinking to myself, the only thing that really probably you could compare that to is napalm being dropped. Mm. And be, imagine being in the middle of that. Mm-hmm. And we know how many people are still missing. Mm-hmm. I mean, these were absolutely one of the most – it was hell on earth there is what it was. Yeah. And he's trying to relate the fact that he understands because he had a kitchen fire one time. I mean, my God. I mean, that was. And then just told you, the whole story. Yeah. Like it was going to be about like that moment should be about him. Right. And 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 made up stuff. Right. You know, he lied about it. That's the thing. He had to embellish a kitchen yeah. fire. Yeah. In order for, you know, in order to say, I, I relate to you because I've been through that hardship, too. Well, no, you haven't been through no, the hell on earth that they, they went through on Maui. No. Stop it. Yeah.
You're listening to Red Eye Radio from the Uniden America Studios. It's Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Harley, and I'm Gary McNamara. I'm trying to see, has there been uh, one death attributed to the hurricane yet? Yes, uh, two. Uh, at oh, least okay. I hadn't seen two I, men in Florida yesterday. It was announced yesterday afternoon, but uh, multiple deaths so far. I don't know okay. the the uh, the number exactly. But I, uh, I'm just going through a bunch of different stories. I'm like, yeah. normally that would be something. The first thing you see, I mm-hmm. did not. I hadn't heard that uh, yesterday. But yeah. so uh, you know, you, you see a lot of uh, you see a lot of uh, of uh, of of damage. You see where flooding came in and wind uh, affected uh, a lot of places, but uh, it. You know, it actually hit an area that is uh, pretty uninhabited. Mm-hmm. Really quick moving, though. That I was just... surprised during the day with the updates. It was like, you know, it seemed, and, and I think in part, my day was kind of going fast. And so I wasn't really, you know, putting the timeline together. We left here at 5 a.m. Central, and it had not uh, hit shore yet. And now, you know, you it was, I I think it was somewhere around noon and reports talking about Georgia and everything else and, and, the, and the effects there. And I thought, well, man, that moved fast. Um, but then I did the timeline and I thought, well, I guess maybe once it got over land and it was going to start heading east, uh, more easterly direction, then that was, you know, I guess that was to be expected. I don't know if it was, if it matched the actual forecast timeline. Uh, and I didn't, I didn't go back to to double check that, but but uh, I'm I guess a fast moving sto- storm is better than one that hovers. You know, yesterday I was watching. I think it was Fox News weather, and they they had a map on there uh, of I, I guess you would say all of the wind currents over the United States, mm-hmm. and it's amazing when you look at how systems weather systems actually happen i i've said this i think i said this here in the last week if 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 i could do it over again i wish i could have taken more meteorology courses and i wish i would have paid more attention in geometry because i'm absolutely fascinated with weather because i want to be the one making the long-term climate predictions no <laughs> yeah, but i'm just i'm fascinated with weather and i'm fascinated with volcanoes i mean i absolutely and i can't believe i had no interest you said the, geometry. Did you mean geology? Did I say geometry? Yeah. She's because <laughs> I have no use for geometry. Little, thank you very much. Geology. Yeah. See, that's why I wasn't good at geology. I hey. thought it was geometry. Hey, where are all the shapes and things? <laughs> well, I don't see one triangle. <laughs> A squared plus B squared equals C squared. <laughs> 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 Thank you for correcting me because I would have, everybody was on there, everybody was sitting there on their phones, you know, emailing me going, Gary, it's no wonder you, it's not geometry, it's geology. What what is the hypotenuse of this rock? I I would have gotten a few, you idiot, Mm -hmm. don't you know the difference? (laughs) (laughs) And now I'll miss that because Eric, you can do it if you want. What? Yeah, okay. (laughs) You idiot, (laughs) don't you know the difference? Oh, no, I'm writing a whole bit about it. Yes, geology, I wish I had... uh, (laughs) Had uh, had more of an interest in it. I can't believe at one point in my life I didn't, but that's what happens when you're young. Uh, but it was fascinating just watching yesterday on uh, Fox Weather, just you know everything over the United States and how everything is affected by the different uh, wind currents, jet streams, you know, wind shear. Because that was one of the things that we had talked about to one of our meteorologists over the last couple of days, which is was the fear that. Uh, Adelia was going to loop right around and come back and hit Florida. Mm-hmm. I think it was yeah. last night. He said, "No, it's not going to happen. That's yeah. that's not going to happen because of of the uh, the wind shear." And now you see the the path is projected to become a you know a tropical uh, you know it is well it, it is a tropical storm now sixty miles an hour stay a tropical storm head towards uh, Bermuda and then sort of take a you know left turn and head sort more north. Mm. So he yeah. was correct on that. So that mm. fear that they or the concern, not fear, but there was a concern early on that it could be one of those. They could loop back around and, and hit Florida again. Yeah. And apparently that is not going to happen because right now I think maximum sustained speeds are 
60 miles an hour. It's still right over the uh, the the coast of South Carolina, the the eye uh, of it, and a lot of places getting a lot of rain. Mm. But uh, it'll it'll move out by well by 8 p.m. tonight. It'll be well out over the uh, the ocean. Yeah, yeah. And so by uh, you know Friday morning, it's you know it's heading more towards Bermuda, and by looks like uh, it seems like it's going to be slowing down because 8 p.m. It'll it'll be southwest of Bermuda. It's interesting because it's in sort of the same area that Franklin was in. Yeah, right. Right before Frank, Franklin moved into the uh, north uh, North Atlantic. So, yeah, um, um, a massive, massive tree. I don't know if you saw it. Yeah, hundred year old tree at the governor's mansion. Yeah. in Florida, uh, yeah. fell uh, fell uh, on part of the house, and the DeSantis family was in the house. Uh, no report of injuries, but. Uh, that that oh I tree was the massive. report I saw said they weren't there. Oh, I I thought it said that some of the family members were, and and maybe that report was wrong. Okay, yeah, I could have it wrong, but nobody was injured. Thank goodness. Right. Yeah. Uh, but a hundred year old tree. That's massive. I mean, it was a huge, huge tree. Uh, you think about the force of Mother Nature in storms like that and the damage. And we had talked to Greg. Tish at our affiliate Real Talk 93.3 the other morning. He had told us that was he said, you know, there's so many trees here like and and I think he said it's been that way, you know, forever. I mean, it's it's you know, it's uh, it's it's not uh, these aren't, you know, for the most part, many of those trees are not the, you know, new plants from, you know, people building or, you know, developing an area. They're trees that have been in their natural state for a long time. That governor's mansion tree was, again, over, I think they said over 100 years old. Yeah, I really, I've been to Tallahassee twice. It was in the 80s. Mm-hmm. And it was, I was, when I was working in Fort Walton Beach, Pensacola, uh, we got it, you know, we did a concert promotion, took a busload of our listeners twice. I think it was to see the police and the fix opening up for the police. Mm. And this was at, it was at Florida state, the arena there. Yeah. And then a couple months later, and I, I really didn't want to go and they were actually really good. It was the Thompson twins in Berlin. Yeah. They were, re- they were great. I mean, yeah. they, I mean, it was, I was shocked at how good they were because I really didn't want to go and, Really wasn't the stuff I was into at that time, but yeah. I, but but I was playing it on the radio, yeah. so uh, right. we went. But uh, but I really I really like the city. I mean, it's a real. Mm. Uh, I thought it was back then. You know, I'm sure people have. No matter where you live, I, when I lived in Rockford, Illinois, when I lived in Rockford in ninety three ninety four. Mm. Uh, Money Magazine had it like as the worst place to live in the United States. Yeah. And anybody who remembers when I worked right. in Rockford at our great affiliate WROK, and I loved living there. I absolutely loved living in Rockford. Yeah, I man, I just sure. thought it was a great place. It was a great place. Uh, lots of uh, you know, uh, a medium sized city, but with lots of you know, I, you you could be out in the the beautiful Midwest country with creeks and streams and everything within minutes. I really really liked it. I remember never forget. My dad visiting me. He had business in Chicago. And so uh, he came in and, and uh, uh, we uh, took a tour around uh, Rockford. And I was and I and I took him to all the, you know, just drove through everything else. I said, Dad, because this is a real nice city. I said, Money Magazine has it the worst place to live in America. He goes, well, if that's the case, then we live in a hell of a great country. It's <laughs> <laughs> a brilliant observation. And analysis by your dad. Yeah. Um, it, first of all, those all of those things are, you know, garbage. When we when we see those, you know, here's the worst city to retire in. Oh, you know, here's the worst. And then all of a sudden, it gets back to well, because there's not enough of these things, and it's just this liberal list of you know agenda items. They don't practice these things. Yeah. Well, okay. You know then what, I'm moving there. Well, you know what they found out? Mm. What they found out was the, the best cities to live when they talked about jobs was the place, a lot of capital cities of states. That, yeah, and, sure. and especially like, you know, Madison, which, you know, again, 
a big government. Madison, Wisconsin's always at the top because there's so much money from the state flowing in there because of the university and because that's where all the politicians gather. Yeah. It's the capital. Yeah. So there's so much consistent government money going in there where it's like, oh, people are doing great. You know, they've got great jobs Well, because that's where all the government money is going to. Yeah. And you find that out a lot of places that had major smaller towns that had major universities and many that were capitals of their their states were always rated high because <laughs> they were getting all the money from the taxpayers all across mm-hmm. the state. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but yeah, I've always thought it was uh, dumb. My my city I live in was a couple of years ago was like the third best place to retire, mm. and then a year later it was like a hundred. It's like oh yeah, in a year it went down, didn't it? Well, you know, a <laughs> uh, former neighbor of mine, his, let's see here, his wife was retiring after 30 years in her career field, but he worked from home. And this is long before the pandemic. And they were moving to Albuquerque because the cost of living by comparison to to our area was much lower. And they were basically gearing up for their fixed income living and said, we like it there. We have friends there. Family's not far from there. So we want to go there. And it's, you know, they we like the area, the whole thing. We've we've uh, traveled there, uh, you know, for years. So, but it was the low cost of living, basically. And I thought, all right, well, that makes sense. You see that with a lot of seniors, like, forever. It was moving from New York to Florida. I mean, Seinfeld did... You know, how many episodes was a couple episodes of the Del Boca Vista? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and moving to Florida from New York was kind of a running joke. It was like, yeah, there's, you know, I-95 is a one way, (laughs) you know, and because it was lower cost of living, of course, the, you know, the climate is different. Uh, It's warmer. But also, you know, you're taking that fixed income, that retirement money, and you're trying to make it go further. And to me, that would be the appeal. I, you know, I live in a major metro area uh, at any point on a fixed income, then I'm, I may have different consideration. I, I don't know. Well, you know, one of the considerations now is not only low cost of living, but they found out that living in a bigger population center means better, better medical care. Mm-hmm. And as you get to retirement age. That becomes extremely important. Yeah. Robert Reich, if you're listening. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I just let him die. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I'm not, I'm not wishing him. I want to make clear I'm not wishing him death. That goes back to 2007 when uh, he was uh, speaking at Berkeley and said his health care plan would be to let all old people die. Mm-hmm. So now he's a lot older than he was back then. And we always wonder, does he still have the same opinion? Right. Exactly. I'm not wishing him death. I want to make yeah. that clear. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So and and. When you look at the, what was the latest one, the best states to do business in, and Texas and Florida were rated very low because they weren't woke. Yeah. No, I mean, (laughs) that's it, because they're not following the liberal agenda. Right. Uh, By the way, an update. Uh, Yes, uh, the uh, first lady of Florida, Casey DeSantis, was in the governor's mansion with uh, their three children. The governor, of course, was was traveling, uh, doing, uh, basically keeping people updated on on the storm and, and what the state and local officials were doing. Uh, but uh, no one injured there at the governor's mansion in Florida, but a massive tree. It, it is a massive tree over a hundred years old uh, that fell. It's an, it was an oak tree and anybody who's at an oak tree, man, I went through so many chainsaws when I had red oaks <laughs> at another property. And it was just like, I had six red oaks and, and if you ever had to, to lift a tree, you know, take some of those lower limbs down. You'll go through some chainsaws. 866-90-RED-EYE. Get in touch with Red Eye Radio, toll free at 866-90-RED-EYE. It's Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Harley, and I'm Gary McNamara. Coming up following uh, the top of the hour, an oldie but goodie. Okay. Uh, we have an oldie but goodie because of something that was in the news uh, uh, yesterday. And we always right. have to bring back the the best ofs, the best of oldies but goodies. Yeah, yeah. But you'll definitely want to, uh, to hear this. 
Uh, also, the U.S. economy grew at a slower pace and uh, an advisor to the president yesterday, you know, the president a couple of weeks ago came out and said, well, the Inflation Reduction Act wasn't really about reducing inflation. Uh-huh. Right. It's like, oh, yeah, we knew we that. know that we knew that we, from the we, beginning. We knew that. And uh, one of his uh, advisors uh, making the rounds yesterday. And it's interesting that, you know, we'll get criticized saying, well, you guys, you're saying this about the president and it's just all partisanship. Well, the beauty of it is when they eventually agree with us, when the truth becomes so clear that they say almost word for word exactly what we say. And on the Inflation Reduction Act, that actually happened Mm -hmm. yesterday. Mm -hmm. Coming up. Top of the Hour News is brought to you by House Products. Visit HouseProducts.com. This is Red Eye Radio on Westwood One. Now, it's Red Eye Radio. Gary McNamara and Eric Harley talk about everything from politics to social issues and news of the day. Whether you're up late or you're just starting your day, welcome to the show from the Uniden America Studios. This is Red Eye Radio. All across America and around the planet, we are Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Harley. I am Gary McNamara. Well, there you go. Yesterday, disgraced lawyer Michael Avenetti was handed a major legal defeat Wednesday as part of the case in which he was convicted of attempting to extort sports apparel brand uh, Nike out of millions of dollars in a 3 nothing decision. The second U.S. Court of Appeals upheld Avenetti's conviction in the case and ruled against his claims that the jurors were not properly instructed in the uh, relevant statute. The appeals panel also rejected Avenetti's argument that the evidence in the case didn't support the charges of extortion and honest services fraud Mm. uh and so as you know he ended up being just an outright crook yeah right and an outright uh, criminal remember what the left had to say to him Mm. how the left how the mainstream media spoke of him when he uh, said he was going to challenge he was considering challenging donald trump in 2020 this is a best of Mm-hmm. This is remember <laughs> what the mainstream media said that they dropped like that. Throwback Thursday. Throwback Thursday. Yes, here we go. Michael Avenatti is laying down the law. And is he really thinking about running for president? Joining me now live, the man himself, Michael Avenatti. Let's talk to somebody who understands the system very well. Michael Avenatti. He's Donald Trump's worst nightmare. Michael Avenatti. Michael, thanks so much for being Morning. here. Did you talk to Stormy Daniels last night? What was her reaction? Did the president just get a new challenger for 2020? Stormy Daniels lawyer Michael Avenatti may have just tossed his hat into the ring. Looking ahead to 2020, uh, one reason why I'm taking you seriously as a contender is because of your presence on cable news. First, let me take a moment to brag on my former student. This dude right here, I think of him as in a Justice League with Robert Mueller to save our democracy. A nine-year-old boy has been reunited with his mother in Guatemala. And the person who helped make this happen, Stormy Daniels' lawyer and potential presidential candidate, Michael Avenatti. What do you say to critics who say this is a publicity stunt? Doing good work, having kids reunited with their parents. I mean, my record speaks for itself. Probably one of the biggest stars we have at this dinner tonight, of course. This is Michael Avenatti. I'm the only person right here Donald Trump fears more than Robert Miller. 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 Please welcome Michael Avenatti. Yeah, I, I do think that, uh, that Trump is afraid of you. Lawyers don't normally do talk shows. I'm not your normal lawyer. Yes, you are something of a folk hero now. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, <laughs> you know, what is wrong with these people? You know, there, there, was a, there was a moment where he was up on a pedestal like Obama was for the left. Yeah, no, he was going to be. He really was. I mean, the, next, really, yeah. the next big thing. <laughs> Just... <laughs> wow. 
Fraud. <laughs> I mean. He's a fraud through and through. Just amazing. Uh, all right. <laughs> Seriously. I, I just, I, wow. When I saw it, I said, oh, good. I get to play that collage of, of statements made by the media. I was, like, all happy about it. Like, all right. going to save justice o- along with Robert Mueller. Yeah. And Miller. Yeah. <laughs> she called him Miller. I know. But his professor calling him, you know, the almost describing him as a superhero. I know. That's stupid. Yeah. His former professor, what a superhero. Yeah. He's this guy's a he's, superhero. He's, he's Superman. Part of the Justice League, along with Robert Mueller. I'm sorry, that Robert Mueller? <laughs> really? He's gonna save the nation. <laughs> what drives that mindset? Well, I do remember reading the book The BS Syndrome, that BS always flows. The biggest BS that's most successful and the biggest bs always flows from the top and that was flowing from the top of the media yeah that's that was pure and we said it at the time we said the time well i mean you know i guess something catches fire on the left and they just can't here's my question have they been burned enough to go okay 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 maybe we don't do that Because that was, you know, you think about, like, uh, Biden. You still have a few Biden defenders, but, I mean, it's weak. Seriously. It it doesn't have what you heard there. No, no, not at all. That was some kind of, if if I didn't know better, I would say they were all smoking weed. (laughs) It's back to the weed again. Because I don't know what's driving your mindset to create this in a lawyer. Except for the fact that, remember, he was going to be, it was always the case. Every time they found someone that would bring Trump down, they were a hero. And that's how you get to all the indictments now. And you look at these indictments, and they're filled with garbage. Uh, I'm sure the first thing that, the left would respond, well, the Republicans have jumped on Ramaswamy. Eh. It's not the same thing. Tell me one issue that Democrats were excited about Michael Avenatti running on. Right. On the so, issues. On the issues. What issue? Right. Ramaswamy came to the forefront because he was talking about specific, over and over again, specific conservative ideology. Now, he got himself burned when he got get into the minutia of a few things over mm-hmm. the last couple of weeks, whether it was legalizing drugs or Taiwan or whatever, where he was backing off and, you know, the the initial things that he had said. But that happens when you're a rookie in the in the political world. Uh, and but at, he was he and, and then he was criticized for that. He's yeah. been criticized. He's been complimented for where he stands on the issues and criticized for having to backtrack on a couple of issues out there. Mm-hmm. But everything that he's being judged on, Ramaswamy is being judged on, is specific issues of what the president of the United States would deal with. Right. And, you know, that wasn't the case with Avenetti. It was just, I'm anti-Trump. I can get Trump with Stormy Daniels. Yeah. That's what that was all well, about. It was, can... it was only for one... He served one purpose. And my gosh, if we have to, we'll just, we'll just put him up there uh, and have him run for president. Where it's, it's the same thing every time when they raided Cohen's office. Oh, he's going to flip. 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 And this is how you get to all these indictments on Trump. But, you know, that, that's sort of a precursor to where we are today. Mm-hmm. And this is probably one of the things that is most frustrating to to us. And we have talked about it before, but it's important to talk about again and again and again. On the actual issues, if you look at the issues, Mm -hmm. the majority of people agree on the issues with the Republicans across the board. Mm -hmm. When you leave the personalities out of it, 
when you simply ask people where they stand, it's probably 65, anywhere between 65 to 75 percent, depending on the issue, where the Republicans stand. Uh, Where the Republicans hurt with the public is the personalities promoting it. Rightly or wrongly, it doesn't matter. We go, well, that's ridiculous. How can they? That's the reality of what we're dealing with today. And that's the frustrating, uh, you know, that's the frustrating part of it. I saw, for example, the headline out there that says uh, the uh, the Republican member, uh, some of these conservative leaders came out, not in Congress, but they came out and said, you know, we uh, we need to, uh, you know, we probably need to have a shutdown. Mm. We need to stop this incredible spending. Mm-hmm. And they made the case here. It was, uh, oh, let me, it figures that when I try to find it, it's the last one, probably the last story in there. No, okay, I can't find it. But it was it was basically conservative leaders uh, say, yes, we need to shut down the government to stop the Biden agenda. Mm-hmm. Well, the predicament you're dealing with and and this is another problem for the Republicans, uh, even if they had the right personalities that didn't affect a significant portion of the the uh, Republican leadership right now. And that is the public knows what the problem is. They know we're spending too much money. But if the Republicans shut down the government, does anybody believe, because it would be, we're not going to shut it down. The cons- the, the uh, conservatives in Congress are saying it's time to shut it down. Republicans will get the blame. Do you think that independents will stand up? Do you think most Republicans will stand up and say shutting down the government is the right thing to do? Hmm. I wish I could say yes. I don't believe that will be the case. I believe that the public, just like politicians, talks out of both sides of their mouth. We need to cut spending. Don't cut my spending. We need to cut spending, and all we need to do is cut. Remember what the public thinks, both Republicans and Democrats. If you cut wasteful spending and foreign aid, we can balance the budget. Everything will be fine. It won't be fine. That's the situation that we're in right now. That's a situation many Americans are in that have too much debt. Mm -hmm. They go, oh, no, we can handle it. We can handle it. We can handle it. We can handle it. Oh, no, we can't handle it. Right. No, over over and over again. And if and and I think that's what it gets down to is that, well, they're really where's the real uh, the real enforcement of holding people to their responsibilities? Where is that? People look at it and go, eh, you know, whatever. I mean, remember when when it got down to the uh, it, it, most states were ending their their uh, unemployment for COVID and the whole thing, and people, some people were making more money staying home than they were making before. And it, and then when it ended, it it was like, you know, yeah, well, I'll still quiet quit. Eh, still not going back. Where's the instinct in the people? Forget the enforcement. There's no instinct. There's no drive in people in order to do the right thing. I don't know if that's generational. I have no idea what it is. The conditioning of America is what I used to call it. I don't know if it's over a period of time. I don't know if it's limited to one generation or two. But, you know, some people are willing to drown in two feet of water when you only have to stand up. And that's exactly what we're facing here and have been facing for a long time. Obama said it years ago. The debt is not a problem. And we came on and said, well, what he's saying is, you know, part of the house is on fire, but you're in a different part of the house. It's not a problem for you at the moment. And it seems 
that mindset is very much in place with a number of people in their personal lives, and certainly it wouldn't be any different in what they want from their elected representatives. It's, it, it's, we're just at that point. If the national debt doesn't matter, because it is the foundation, it, it, it compromises our ability for all of those core roles of government that will also be in peril. They will be under fire because when it starts happening, when we reach that tipping point of no longer being able to serve the interest on the debt, then things will be cut. They'll be gone. It won't, and they won't come back. You know, we are at a point where we used to be able to blame it and say, well, people really don't know what's going on. And, and so that's the problem. If people knew what was going on, they would vote differently. We haven't seen that's the case so far. We have seen some movement, for example, over the last couple of election cycles with Hispanic voters. But overall, we haven't seen this huge shift of the insanity that's coming from the left. And to give you another example, latest poll out, 60 percent of voters say Joe Biden had a role in indicting Donald Trump. Yeah. So the public understands or believes that the Biden administration is corrupt just from what they know already. My question would be, how many of that group are okay Okay with it? Yeah. With him doing that, with Biden being part of it. The poll came out the other day that 50 percent of Democrats would not be okay, would not vote for Biden if they found out he took a bribe, which means (laughs) the other 50 percent. Half of half of the people. No, I'm okay with that. Again, as long as we can beat Trump, put Trump behind, you know, Michael Avenatti, you heard it. You heard them cooing over him for one reason, as long as he can get Trump. 86690 Red Eye. Smart owner operators make every single week as profitable as possible. One trip is not enough time to be considered profitable or unprofitable, and an entire month may be too much time to manage. One week is the right amount of time to deal with efficiently. To do so, look at the advantages and disadvantages of every day of the week. Match trip length to the optimum day of the week. Plan to deliver on the day you have the best opportunity of getting a load. Your personal weekly plan will vary depending on the weekly delivery flow cycle of your region, typical length of haul, personal requirements, and other factors. What's important is to have a specific weekly plan that helps you be successful. Owner-Operator Business 101 is provided by Shell Rotella with advanced synthetic technology. For more information, go to OverdriveOnline.com to the Overdrive's Partners in Business section of the website. For more detail on Business 101 and many other topics. We'll be right back with more Red Eye Radio with Eric Harley and Gary McNamara. It's Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Harley, and uh, I'm Gary McNamara. So, uh, you know, being uh, the fact that, uh, you know, we've almost reached to September, we have another debate coming up on the 27th, and, you know, we look at all the issues out there and where people stand, that's the frustrating thing, as we've stated over and over again, that on the actual issues, the American public knows what the right thing is to do. The majority of the American public that would give the Republicans uh uh, you know, both the presidency and 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 both houses of Congress. You have the numbers that exist there where if you look at the polling, you would normally say, well, this is a huge advantage to the Republicans. Well, why aren't they up by 10 points? Right. If they're up on the issues, if they lead on almost every issue, 65 to 35, where people actually stand, if you take the personalities out of it and you ask the question, for example, should we have open borders or should there be a process that that uh, a closely scrutinized process of vetting people coming in to this country or should we allow everyone in 
and then check on whether we'll give them status while they're in the country uh, over a 10-year period, Hmm. or should their asylum claims be made outside the country, except in these particular cases where it's known, for example, that something is going on, where it's common knowledge, you would have 65 to 70 percent of the people say, no, this shouldn't be going on. If you actually break it down on energy, on electric vehicles and everything else, and you break down the issues about what the truth is, the people would go with Republicans and the polls show they will. But they don't like the personalities. Right. speakers say play red eye radio and if you're really nice she might red eye radio and he's eric harley and i'm gary mcnamara all right we had mentioned quiet quitting here in the last half hour yeah i and i realized i saw a story in the last couple of weeks mm. <laughs> relating to quiet quitting right and uh this is a a new term that's been coined uh, and these are the noisier cousins of quiet quitters. Mm-hmm. These are called loud laborers, uh, a term uh, coined by an organizational behavior professor and dean at Bain's Business School, Andre Spicer. These are employees who place more emphasis on making their work known rather than focusing on the work itself, said Nicole Price, a leadership coach. And workplace uh, expert. By the way, Gary and Eric doing a hell of a job. Uh, they are <laughs> they use various methods of self promotion, talking more about what they are doing or plan to do rather than actually doing the work. <laughs> hey, everybody, <laughs> getting ready to file this report. <laughs> Coming down, <laughs> we're going to do this. <laughs> According to Price, there are two easy ways to tell. Who's a loud laborer? You don't see much work getting done, and they talk an awful lot about the work that they are doing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, loud laborers often uh, are often quite politically savvy and are very active on professional social networks where they publicize their tasks and achievements. Would that be on LinkedIn? Probably on LinkedIn, TikTok, Twitter, uh, MySpace. Vicky Salemi, a <laughs> career expert at, at jobsportalmonster.com, makes the distinction between someone who confidently asserts themselves at work and a loud laborer. The former picks and chooses when to speak up uh, to shine a spotlight on their work, whereas the latter may crave attention and, and love to hear themselves talk, even when it is nothing extraordinary. (laughs) They were simply doing their job, she added. Why do loud laborers exist? (laughs) I have to know. (laughs) Believe it or not, some people talk too much about their accomplishments or lack thereof because they lack self-esteem or insecure. Therefore, they overcompensate. Also, some people are motivi- motivated by external rewards and recognition rather than the inherent satisfaction of the work itself. Hmm. That can lead to a focus on visibility and self-promotion in order to attract these awards. Salimi so pointed out that the workers may feel the need to self-promote constantly because they are not getting the recognition or attention from bosses or colleagues. Well, that's us, right? We don't get the recognition for the incredibly great stuff that we do. Yeah, but you and I know why we don't. (laughs) That's the difference. We get it. 
because I'm not really into doing the show. I just want the recognition and fame and the chicks. Listen, I'm here, okay? I'm here in the middle of the night. Let's just leave it right there. (laughs) Or it could be the other extreme. They're overly confident about their work and brag about it. But here's the thing. There are stellar performers, but boasting about every project every day is usually not exemplary. She has. Hey, listen, I went in the break room and fixed the toothpick holder, everybody. It is not going to be a problem getting those toothpicks out now. You're welcome. I love this next line. It's great. Unfortunately, if you are a loud laborer, your behavior could negatively impact your team the way I saw that the other day. Yeah. Stop calling business relationships a team. <laughs> I saw that on social media this week. That's getting more play that, you know, where the the head boss always says, well, the team, the team, the team, the team, the team. <laughs> well, uh, the thing is, is that we all know <laughs> really not a team. <laughs> Because it's not a team effort. Uh, Yeah. The team and I. uh, (laughs) Or (laughs) what's one above the team? Group? No, we're family. (laughs) Oh, no. Stop that right now. (laughs) Unless your last name is Trump. Stop it. (laughs) Or Biden. (laughs) Well, now we can include the Bidens. <laughs> the Bidens in there. It's, it's, now, they make their money in different ways, but it can irritate. it's a family business. It can irritate your peers to always be tooting your own horn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Furthermore, hmm. like they needed a study for this. Furthermore, a 2021 study found that having... A self-promotion climate within work groups can diminish work group cohesion. (laughs) Loud laborers may create a work environment where visibility and self-promotion are valued more than actual results, (laughs) which could demotivate employees who are quieter. (laughs) No, I mean, but there are so many people in, in so many fields politics where you get especially politics i don't consider that work i consider it something very different but you look at people in different fields and you think to yourself well how did how did that person get there how did they get to where they are i mean they don't you know they it's it's like they don't they, they really don't demonstrate that they've got that kind of knowledge or experience. And I think to my, I always qualify that with myself saying, well, uh, I don't know what they know. So I, I really can't answer that question. But then that was actually brought up on a podcast the other day. You wonder how people get to certain, you know, levels, like certain ranks I, or I, I work, whatever. I worked for a guy. Uh, he was the top boss. Mm-hmm of a radio station, and everyone knew, everyone knew that he was a pathological liar. Mm. He lied about everything all the time Mm. to the point where everybody knew about it. Right. I was only there for a couple of years, but I always wondered if he was a pathological liar and he's at the top of the food chain, (laughs) the business food chain, how did he get there? Well, that, that that is what really, and I wasn't doing that from a form of from a a uh, a position of of anger or uh, because he's a pathological liar, he screwed me over, which he really did. I mean, I never really got you know, it wasn't anything that was personal to me with my wanting to analyze it, but it was more of a sociological thing. How could somebody? who was such a pathological liar. I mean, lied about everything, and everybody talked about him behind his back and how he was a pathological liar. How he got to that position and continued to get raises and and in a in a very in a very sales 
performance oriented business, Mm -hmm. how he got to that point when you knew that if he was a salesperson before he was lying to everybody, including the, the clients, what he, what he could, you know, what uh, the, the performance he could guarantee them lying to his boss because he lied to everybody. And so you would assume that his entire business career, he was lying and you say, how did he get to the top? Why didn't somebody say, okay, yeah, he's good in a couple of ways, but he's a pathological liar. We can't have him running an organization. Right. Yeah. And But actually, it's the whole fake it till you make it. Well, fake it till you make it, and then when you make it, keep faking it. And uh, that happens in a number of fields. Um, lawyering, Michael Avenetti. <laughs> Sales, but never in our sales department here for Red Eye Radio ever. Uh, it happens in the media with when they bring on someone. Well, this the next person is a so-called expert. Well, I would always want to know, you know, if they say, well, this person spent uh, 20 years at the FBI. Uh, OK. All right. Uh, this person was a, you know, is and here's and they they kind of give you their their experience. Um, we know like with uh, with Turley, you know, we. You can you know what what he has done uh, with Andrew McCarthy. You know what he's done, but then far too often you hear, "Well, this person is, is an expert." Case in point, I had a, a, a television station uh, several months ago call me and say, "Well, we want to have you on because you're an expert in 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 uh, the trucking industry." I said, "Whoa, whoa, 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 stop! I'm in the media, like you guys." I said, "That's." That's you, you can put, you know, if you want that, you, you can put that. But I if you're looking for the expert, uh, you're going to have to find somebody, you know, because they were talking about right. diesel supply at the time. And I actually told the reporter, I said, if you're looking for an expert, I'm not your guy. I can comment comment based on um, the limited analysis that that I can provide. But you need to know exactly, you know, if you're going to. Um, if you're going to present me to your audience in this in this piece that you're putting together, you know, don't don't position me as an expert. Were I mean, they because were, that's, were they as concerned with that as you were? They were when I told them. Okay. Yes. All right. Well, there's some intent, and I don't there. know where they got that idea but, I, from. But, you know what I mean? And, and the only reason I ask it is not because of your particular situation. Well, actually, but, but, I, actually, but just, I can't answer that question because I don't know if his if his news director would have cared if. If I would have just said, okay, fine, you know, and they said, you're an expert. Okay, fine, put me on. Then they put, I don't think they would have done the homework in that case to qualify that they were just going to do an interview and then on the graphics put me down as an expert. Yeah, and I, I see it all the time, experts. You and I talk about experts. They're not experts. This, and we sit there and we hear their analysis. We go, they, they don't know what the hell they're talking about. Exactly. They're completely exactly. and totally clueless. Right. But, the, but what I guess is so is the media. Or they, the, the, you know, or they it, don't care. Or, or they or they don't care. Either they're clueless or they don't care or they're ignorant and don't know, especially on technical things. I see it all the time. Mm-hmm. They have no idea on things. For example, anyone, you know, you're starting to see it now, the media. Oh, yeah, I guess we can't run it on solar and wind. Mm-hmm. Yet for decades, nobody, nobody was really speaking out. Very few people and the people that were speaking out about it like us, mm-hmm. you're viewed as a political partisan. Well, they're just trying to make a political point because they don't believe in in uh, in uh, in in uh, in climate change. They don't believe in science. They don't believe in this. You know, blah 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 blah. And so they just discount your position. And all the experts they go to are just basically are really the real partisans that don't have any technical experience that don't doesn't know how electricity is produced that does not know how electric vehicles really work that does not know the the uh, uh the material and chemicals and the manufacturing process of batteries and electric vehicles and everything else are completely clueless on it they just come out with political statements and they're viewed as experts the majority of experts that i see in the media, are not experts. And then they'll group them together in, in a story. Experts say, "Yeah, well, what? who's saying this? Show me the data. Show me from people in the field that have been in the field for a while that say 
we've seen this before, or we know what these conditions are, or here's the data, here are the numbers, and this is what this means. 86690-RED-EYE. Coming up, more with Gary McNamara and Eric Harley. It's Red Eye Radio. It's Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Harley, and I'm Gary McNamara. Coming up following uh, the top of uh, the hour, uh, this story from the New York Post uh, from just a couple of hours ago, Hunter Biden's firm uh, and uh, Joe's vice presidential office exchanged more than 1,000 email records show. Mm -hmm. 860 have been released, 200 not released uh, because of executive privilege, which, by the way, in because this these these are freedom of information requests from legal firms, not Comer. Right. This, isn't right. Comer. this is not Congress right. doing this. Right. This is not Congress doing it at all. AFlegal.com is America right. First Legal. Uh, they have th- they have released 861 of these right. emails on their website. And it looks like I was reading some of the analysis because we had a bunch of questions. Wall Street Journal answered most of my questions yesterday in an op-ed piece, or not an op-ed piece, but an editorial that we'll get into that they found out about the pseudonyms because they backtracked. They were on the names were on emails that Hunter Biden had on his laptop. Yeah. So all of this goes every, back to his laptop. Right. Every, everything that yeah. every, everything that we learn comes directly from Hunter Biden. Yeah. And you notice how quiet the Democrats have been this week on it. By the way, correction, aflegal.org, not .com. Okay. aflegal.org is America First Legal, where these emails, 861, are now have been released. This is Red Eye Radio on Westwood One. Now, it's Red Eye Radio. Gary McNamara and Eric Harley talk about everything from politics to social issues and news of the day. Whether you're up late or you're just starting your day, welcome to the show from the Uniden America Studios. This is is Red Eye Radio. <laughs> All across America, we are Red Eye Radio. Hey, he is I'm, Eric Carley, and I'm Gary McNamara. I was busy loud working during the break. You were, yes, he was loud working. You he, he replaced the uh, the toner toner waste. What was it called? <laughs> toner waste bucket, I think. The container. Container, yeah, all right. And he was getting, he was actually getting uh, articles, printing articles that I wanted. So he was actually well, they were they were stuff. It was stuff you printed. It just automatically came out. Right, yeah. you were being my servant. All right, slow down, Eric Harley. You were ensuring that I, I was smart enough to replace the toner waste cartridge. <clears throat> Unlike some people. I didn't know it was sitting there. I don't, I'm not going to mess with it's it. It's right there in the supplies. Oh, I didn't see it. It says toner waste cartridge on the box. Oh, I oh. didn't see any. I just saw the little cardboard box sitting on top, and I didn't know what it was. Mm. I it has it. letters I, and stuff. Look, I'm not going to deal with printers. I'm like the dude on uh, Office Space. Yeah. I'm not doing this technology thing here. Leave that to the technology team. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> I am caveman talk show no. host. <laughs> Back in my I've, day, we just wrote it down. I'm not. I don't need a printer. I'm not familiar with your complicated printer ways. This is why people can't write in cursive. For those under the age of nine uh, of ninety, uh, cursive is when you. Well, never mind. You won't need it. <laughs> Can you text in cursive? All right, so the thing that we were actually looking at, we're just looking at the com- combining the, 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 the uh, well, the, the story of the 5,000 emails with the latest New York Post story. That's what we're doing during the break. Mm-hmm. And, and just so you know, we had talked yesterday about the 5,000 
100 email messages in which uh, Vice President Biden used a uh, fake name for government business. And uh, the question is why? And as the South, uh, what is it, the uh, Southeastern Legal Foundation is saying uh, the majority of those emails were about Hunter Biden business. By the way, one thing this is blows out of the water. Maybe it's and the interesting thing is so many things coming out every day and so many different other things in the news, you know, the hurricane, whatever, that these stories come out. And I even said this for, for Monday. I went, OK, just another thing. And then I thought about it after and went, well, wait a minute. Oh, my God, this is huge because this completely blows out of the water. The the New York Post story that we'll get to in a moment and the story the other day about the 5100 uh, email uh, messages because it shows that just how big of a lie it was. Because if you have, let's put it this way, uh, 5,000 uh, 5, emails, and I don't even know the 5,000 emails where he used a uh, pseudonym. I don't know uh, what period of years that was over. But he was in office for eight years. Right. So that's a that's a 1,000 emails. Uh, well, that's more than a 1,000 emails. Uh, five thousand times uh, eight. No, it's uh, it would be uh, no, it would be uh, under that. Uh, it would um, roughly be. Uh, let me see. Well, this latest batch from America's First Legal was a batch that were sent and received between January twenty eleventh or twenty eleven and December twenty thirteen. Well, that's the New York Post story. I don't know if those are the same emails. You're talking about the 5,400 emails versus the... No, no, the 5,100 emails, and then the rest of them are different files and things like that. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. Yeah, but if you look at uh, the 861 uh, between January 11th, so you're talking roughly basically three, uh, 2011, 2012, 2013, that's three years. Six. Oh, oh, was it three years they said for the? For no, 5, no, 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 for the 861. Oh. I was doing the math on the 361 or on the 861. Oh, okay. I'm, so, all right. So I'm, I'm doing this for the, the eight, let's say it's eight years. That would be 637 emails a year. Right. Uh, divided by uh, 12, 53 emails a month. Mm-hmm where Joe Biden is using a fake name Mm -hmm. to do business as a Southeastern legal uh, uh, group says foundation says to do business with Hunter. That's more than one a day. And was he even in the office every day? Well, based on his presidency Mm -hmm. as vice president, I'm, I'm guessing he took even more vacations. It's over one and a half a day. Then again, he could have had a server in his home. But that and and so <laughs> and so you look at it and you say that goes from remember Biden saying he had no, I never discussed business ever with mm-hmm. Hunter, mm-hmm. had no idea what business Hunter was even in, to now five thousand one hundred emails using fake names according to the Southeastern Legal Foundation that he was discussing business and then the story that well first off let me do let me do this story here because it backs up what we have what we said uh, uh, yesterday. The Southeastern Legal Foundation on Monday sued the National Archives under the Freedom of Information Act, demanding access to some 5,100 email messages in which then-Vice President Biden used a pseudonym for government business. The National Archives has admitted having Joe Biden's emails from three different names. Uh, House Oversight Committee Chairman James Comer wants to see all of the fake email, excuse me, the fake name emails as well as the unredacted versions of a few that have been made public. A Comer spokesperson says the National Archives says it has sent some of the records to representatives of former President Obama and Joe Biden for their approval to be released because they can, they can sit there and say, okay, no, that has executive privilege on it because that was things that was being discussed. And it's like, okay, that's how you hide it. Chuck Grassley and Ron Johnson first demanded access to Joe Biden's fake names in early mid-2021, after Hunter Biden's famous laptop showed the Veep's office used private or alias accounts to send government information to Hunter. So we had asked yesterday, where did all these emails come from? 
and we said they had to come from the laptop. That's how, that's how they knew about it. There's no other way they could have known about it, and that's how they knew about it. One email alerted Hunter to a call the vice president made to then Ukrainian President Poroshenko at the same time Hunter was on the board of Ukrainian gas giant Burisma. Another laptop entry shows Biden using his business email in 2014 to write to his father's Robinware account, asking the vice president to call him before making a specific government staffing decision. Why use email addresses designed to skirt searches of government records? Without the public exposure of Hunter's laptop by the New York Post, nobody would know an extra set of vice presidential communications existed under obscure addresses. That's how you get around it, because when you search for the millions, tens of millions of records that the National Archives have, you would have communications between Hunter Biden and Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. The pseudonyms would not have come up. Right. So the questions you and I have asked of how do you create a fake government email? Because one of the emails was a fake government email that was tied to the presidential executive branch office, not even vice president, and the Pentagon. How? And the others looks like that they were just under private emails. But one was a government email. Uh, The clandestine emails fit a pattern that GOP investigators are uh, piecing together of a behind-the-scenes effort by Hunter to sell his father's power in Washington in which Joe played along. Mr. Comer on Wednesday also requested that the National Archives provide all documents, communications, and manifests related to Vice President Biden's use of Air Force Two and Marine Two following a Fox News report that Hunter traveled to at least 15 foreign countries with his father on official trips. Government employees are discouraged from using their private email to conduct government business, and when they do, they are required to forward all relevant documents to federal record keepers. There's no reason for the White House to refuse disclosing these official vice presidential records unless it is something that it wishes to hide. Mm. That's from the Wall Street Journal yesterday. Mm. Then the new New York Post story. That uh, came out just to, what, 1047 last yeah, night? Yeah, right. Uh, and that's uh, Hunter Biden's firm. Hunter Biden's firm and Joe Biden's vice president's office exchanged more than 1,000 emails. Hunter Biden's Rosemount Seneca Partners investment firm traded more than 1,000 emails with Joe Biden's office during his time as vice president. And hundreds remain hidden because of executive privilege asserted by the White House documents received by the National Archives show. The 861 emails that reference Rosemont Seneca were sent or received by the office of the vice president between January 2011 and December 2013, according to America First Legal, which obtained the messages from the National Archives and Records Administration and released them on Wednesday. The White House refused to allow the release of 200 emails referencing Hunter Biden's firm, citing executive privilege. Release would disclose confidential advice between the president and his advisors or between such advisors. NARA informed the America First Legal in response to its records request. Hunter Biden and his business associates frequently use their direct line of communications with the office of the vice president to uh, to leverage access to the Obama White House, the trove of email show, White House guest list seating arrangements, assignments and biographies of guests for various official events, including the 2012 United Kingdom State Dinner, the 2013 Turkey State Luncheon, and the 2014 France State Dinner were shared with Rosemount Seneca employees. One email contained an invitation forwarded to the White House for then Vice President Joe Biden, to attend an event at UCLA Berkle Center for International Relations. Another invites then Second Lady Jill Biden to participate in a World Foods Program campaign. Invitations from the White House for several events that Hunter Biden presumably attended or had requested tickets for guests are also shown in NARA's document 
uh, 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 dump. And when you do the math on those three years, so 2011, 2012, 2013, and then you divide it by the, uh, you know, the number of days, and then you you look at um, the number of emails here, we're talking about uh, 1,061, 200 of them haven't been released, 861 have. That's almost one per day if you include Saturday and Sunday. Yes. So I don't know if they're inc- that's included so in the 5100. It is on an average, right. It's on an average of one per one per workday. It does, and keep in mind, Biden as, as VP would not be in that office every day. And they don't say that these are the emails that use the pseudonyms. No, they don't. So this might have been this the official line, which was, mm-hmm. can you get me tickets? Can you do this? Can you do that? Can you do that? Right. But it does show a direct line of Rosemont Seneca. Right. And and the other thing is, and I believe Comer will be able to get the other emails because it's not just everything is about the relationship between Joe Biden and Hunter Biden. And uh, that is, you know, that's the key there, because the key would be, well, then what is the executive privilege for? Who are you communicating with? If, if this were just getting uh, Hunter and his colleagues some tickets to the Easter egg roll or access to a state dinner, then why would that be under executive privilege? You know, if the claim is right. that, oh, no, this was just about, you know, he's he's uh, the VP's son and he wanted to show out to his colleagues. He wanted to you know, gain access so that it, it's just a photo op kind of thing helps the business. Now, the way they phrase it at for America's first legal website on the page where they've, uh, you know, basically broken down these 861 emails, you know, the first point they make, and again, this is America's first legal phrasing this Rosemont Seneca was merely the private arm of Joe Biden's office of the vice president. Well, you know, Mike, it, it does get back to what was asked, what was given, what kind of, you know, uh, content is in there. If it is about visiting the White House, all right, uh, they're still, by the way, crossing a line. Number two, it's, well, maybe number one actually is Biden's, I, I don't know anything about my son's business. No, actually, you were directly involved. Well, but what it what it does do, because I'm sure the the White House said, okay, these ones can go. And then you can have Raskin come on and say, these are just innocent emails from Rosemont Seneca because Hunter worked for them, talking about things like tickets and getting that and all that. And uh-huh. It may be inappropriate, but there's nothing illegal that they were doing whatsoever. Meanwhile, the 200 that haven't been released is what you really that's want to what, look at. That's what you want to look at. If those are only about Easter egg roll tickets, then we want to know exactly why they haven't been released, why that falls under executive privilege. And the other thing is, what were the ones? Because it doesn't say that these were, this looks like this was the official email account. Nobody's talking about that these were the emails where they were using fake names. Yeah, no, this no, this doesn't include, in fact, uh, trying to go through here some of these and looking at, at um, email addresses. Um. But I don't see anywhere in the coverage of this uh, from the New York Post where they're saying, you know, that includes the fake names that, that we uh, talked about before. Yeah. But you're really into interesting territories with all the emails with the fake names and the fake name using a government email. How do you do that? How do you get a fake name for a government email? How do you initiate that? I know in no corporation can you do that. I don't know any city or state government where any employee could do that, right? Mm -hmm. You don't set it. You're simply told, this is your email. Yeah. You don't get a chance. You can do that personally at home. I can come up with 20, 50, 100 different emails for me personally. How do you do it at work when basically HR or whatever the personnel department in the White House, anywhere are the ones that would give you your email how do you get to create an email for a person that does not exist? Yeah, right. And did anybody question that when the vice president did that? Right. 866-90-RED-EYE. Lines open for your calls. 866-90-RED-EYE on Red Eye Radio.
It's Front Eye Radio. He is Eric Hurley, and I'm Gary McNamara. Uh, wow. So it's going to get interesting when the Republicans get back uh, next week and to see where they're going to go uh, with all this. And I do believe it's going to be an impeachment inquiry. I think they'll probably frame it that this is not an impeachment yet, but uh, we're being held back. Uh, Washington uh, Examiner has a story. Department of Justice tells uh, 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 Jim Jordan that the FBI subpoenas can't be enforced. Uh, warns that the Hunter Biden inquiry is ongoing. This is where uh, uh, the House Judiciary Committee is trying to get those two FBI agents that were at that meeting Mm. with Weiss, where he said, you know, I'm not really in charge. Mm. They want to talk to him. Yep. And they want to, you know, they want to bring them in. And when you bring them in, they don't get to have lawyers with them when you bring them in for a deposition. Right. The FBI is saying, well, no, they have to have company lawyers there with them to tell them what questions they can answer. They go, that's not how it's done. They said, sorry, you don't get them. We have a current investigation ongoing, Mm -hmm. which is what you and I have. I'm looking at you that way because that's Mm -hmm. what we had said they were going to do. They're Mm -hmm. going to keep witnesses away from the House Judiciary Committee by doing this. Now, if you get to an impeachment inquiry, will they have to testify? That changes the ballgame a little bit. Yeah. 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 it changed because the authority is right. very different. Now, now you would have to get and be able to tie it in. Probably the court would under, have to understand why, you know, to re- everything you have to do has to relate Hunter directly to Joe because that's where the impeachment inquiry is about. Exactly. Radio from the Uniden America Studios. It's Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Carly, and I'm Gary McNamara. Uh, download our Red Eye Radio app today, and you can listen when and where you want. If you can't listen live overnight, so I'm just I'm reading this article. It's just hilarious. The companies that hate their customers. <laughs> Talking about Bud Light. Oh. Mm. Well, and 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 just what what Bud Light did, and then follows it up with something else here, mm-hmm. and they're following up with I don't. Did you see the story where uh, CNN is going to start their streaming service again? Remember CNN Plus? It only lasted what weeks? Yeah, <laughs> they're starting it up again. Except you're not going to have to pay for it. You get it uh, if you buy the old HBO Max, which is now Max. You get the free CNN streaming service. But mm-hmm. here's what they plan on doing. So you go to, for example, last year for a couple of months, I actually got H, it was HBO Max back then. Max now for a couple of months, I signed up. Why? Because, come on, I had to see, uh, what was it, you know, the, the Christmas story updated. Yeah. You right. know, yeah. Ralphie as an adult. I had to right. watch it. Mm-hmm. You know, and I... Got it for uh, a few months and actually was able to, when I went back to see the family, all you know, all my nieces and nephews, like, wow, well, you can only watch it on Max. I go, I got it on my phone. We'll cast it, you know, to your mom's TV. And I mm-hmm. did. And they all really enjoyed it. You yeah. know, it was it was great because they right. loved the Christmas story. Yeah. And it was great to see it updated. Not that it's, you know, it's not, it wasn't, for example, critically acclaimed and it's not going to receive an Emmy or, or, or grant or not a Grammy, but a uh Academy Award, mm. but it fit perfectly that movie. I mean, it fit. Right. It was like the ending you wanted to see a conclusion to that, which would be Ralphie as an adult, right? And and so in, enjoyed that. Well, now this year it might be different if I say, well, I need to subscribe again for a couple of months because I got to watch it again. Got to watch a Christmas story every year. Got to do that. What might happen this time, though, as reported by Variety, among the features the company will try out are ways of alerting Max viewers to breaking news on CNN while they are watching something else on the service. Whether it be an HBO series, a Turner Classic selection, uh, an old episode of Food Network's Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives, or (laughs) 
Ralphie's A Christmas Story as an adult. <laughs> and he writes here, if Max executives think that you do not deserve uninterrupted access to escapist entertainment such, you, such that you can shut yourself off from the world, Max executives don't think highly of you at all. The very concept of interrupting a paid streaming broadcast, because you're paying for the service. Right. A paid streaming broadcast for anything that fails to amount to a catastrophic or an acute emergency suggests at least some discomfort with Max's mission statement, which is to entertain an audience. But maybe the company and executives don't think that's their mission. According to its website, HBO just doesn't entertain. They wish to inspire you. At the heart, this is what's in the small print. At the heart of HBO is our passion for making a difference, and every day we are using our platform to educate, inspire thoughtful action, and make the world a better place. The site's boilerplate corporate plablum reads, but a streaming service can only make the world a better place at the margins and only subjectively. What the company can do and do well is entertain people with quality programs that allows them for just a few blessed minutes to avoid thinking about the imperfect world in which they are born. If that is not enough for Max's executives, maybe they're in the wrong business. They just hit on something, and I would say this, you can expand this out and apply it to all of what Hollywood and the entertainment industry is putting out. You forget why why you're there. What was late night television about? Originally, it was about, okay, kids are off to bed. We're going to give you a few laughs, a little bit of entertainment before you call it a night. Yeah. Mindless entertainment. Yeah. Some people call it. Mm-hmm. No, you know. But Hollywood has become about reminding you at every step of all of what you encounter everywhere else. So now you can't escape it. Well, entertainment has always been about an escape. And now it can't be the escape because we're going to remind you of everything else you're trying to forget. Can you imagine the way that these 24-7 networks have breaking news? And they're interrupting five or six times. It's like going during a movie. It's like going to the <laughs> dentist for a, a cleaning, and they serve Oreos in the lobby. Well, my dentist does give you a milkshake at the end if you want it. Yeah, right. right. They do. They well, no, it. my my yeah. dentist actually had hard candy in the lobby, and I said, "Man, you're really <laughs> buying for business, aren't you?" <laughs> it's you, you want it's me to. Real- you want me to really break my teeth before I go in there. Um, this is exactly, again, it's exactly why you're, that Hollywood is always scrambling. Because it's one thing to make a social statement and make people think. And there are things that, that happen in entertainment across the board. Music, uh, movies, TV. But for the most part, people want to sit and they want to laugh or they want to watch an action movie, something to completely forget about everything else that's going on in the world. Whether it's personal or anything else they encounter, they go there to veg out. That's the idea. But no, we need to bring it back to you and put it back in front of you. Well, I'm gone. I'll turn it all off and go outside. You know, and I think of when um, Top Gun Maverick came out because I was doing cleaning stuff again over the weekend. And, mm-hmm. and uh, it's like, and, and was done with that and finished with the day. I go, well, let me go back because I love my my sound, my home theater system. It's just the best. Mm-hmm. I went, you know, I haven't watched it in a while. I haven't watched it in months. Let me put it on again. Watch the entire thing. I mean, and and everything that was in it, and I, and my thought was like as I'm going through it, I go, wow, I mean, the camera stuff in this is just incredible, especially the plane scenes, mm-hmm. and then 
when you've got a great home theater system where it sounds like you're in the movie Mm -hmm. and you start analyzing every single sound that comes in and you realize the work that they put in to give you as, you know, uh, as even more realistic. I mean, just because I've been in an F-16 and I know what it's like and you're not hearing sounds in a surround sound come at you Mm -hmm. like you do, but it's perfect. I mean, it's just... And I'm like, God, this is so entertaining. It was just, I mean, it was it was the perfect kind of action movie that brought all different human emotions in without really lecturing you in a woke way at all. Mm-hmm. In fact, it would be viewed probably by the left as not a woke way because it was the American military succeeding at something. <laughs> yeah, right. But I mean, it was just, but I just thought, I go, you know, this is what you want. That's what you want from an action movie. And there's a certain, I think, uh, perfection of all the senses that you expect from a great movie. If it's going to be a, and you think about it, who else, where is that expectation greater than any Tom Cruise movie, which would be a Mission Impossible or something like Top Gun Maverick? And you see, I mean, the things that he does in Mission Impossible, it's like, I can't wait to, but it takes you away from, you watch that, you're not thinking of anything except this is the most awesome thing and should i become a scientologist the day that john wick four hit theaters there was a ton of conversation and one question when does john wick five come out (laughs) and that is it, it because it started almost in a cult following kind of way, mm-hmm. but then caught on. And there were some very funny interviews with, uh, with Keanu Reeves early on in the first, after the first John wick and a couple of funny, uh, guys on, on social media that talked about the number of bullets fired and he played along with it and had fun. And they were, you know, it was all right. What is, the, what is this movie? Right. It's, it's action. It's over the top. It's so over the top. Yeah, it is. Yeah. That, of course, it's not real. That's the whole point. Then you can take, and I'm not a huge superhero movie guy, but they make billions and billions of dollars. Why is that? Because it's over the top. It's not real. It's something completely irrelevant to all of life. And we... I often say that. Well, there's so much entertaining stuff that is uh, total nonfiction that you can read and engage in. Well, that's not what people are looking to do when they go see that kind of movie. They're looking to escape. And you look at the Barbie movie. Oh, yeah. Over a billion dollars. <laughs> you know, and it's, you know, it's it's all of this, you know, it's not going to it's not a movie that attracts an old guy like me or me, you know, but I know why people are going to see it. I know why they have to redo Spider-Man. What have they done? Nine, 12 movies. And then they have mm-hmm. three different, you know, it's well, well, this guy's the new Spider-Man. Well, didn't they just have a Spider-Man? <laughs> the more they do that, the older I sound. It's not Toby Maguire. I remember <laughs> Toby Maguire. That's a real you know, you know, Michael Keaton is Batman in the Flash. You know everybody's losing their mind. Let's calm down. It's Michael Keaton. No, but those moments, not that regular for me. For example, regular life is great. Work life is great. I mm-hmm. loved. You know, you and I talk about this we, all the time. We. We had a, we, we had dive a, in head first to this stuff. Yeah, we we yeah. had we had a discussion on this just the other the other day about just the trials and tribulations that happen in in life that you have, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden you know you you're still doing your show prep during the day, but just the the short time of doing your show you know the, of doing of getting up of getting up and then just driving in you're of a shorter distance for me putting mm-hmm. everything together mm-hmm. and everything else goes away, mm-hmm. but you do this all the time. But when you can focus on a movie or listen to great music or go to a concert and everything is taken away and you, you know, all of the rest of life is taken away and you're immersed in something that is powerful and emotional, but completely separate from your life. 
I think that's such a positive, uplifting thing for most people to go through that experience. I, I really yeah. do. And yeah. and I and the you know we live we live in a world where political activism is so great that there are many on the left, especially that don't want you to get a moment's break from what their narrative is. Right. They don't want it. Well, no, I mean, it is, it's, it really is, number one, what drives their agenda. It, it's what gives them worth in their mind. But the fact of the matter is people want to check out. As long as Hollywood is going to and corporations are going to shove all the woke stuff in front of you, you can't check out. And people walk away from it. I talked about it with beer, with Bud Light. When you when you ask someone, hey, you want to go have a beer? You're, it's not about the beer. You're going to hang out and have a conversation. The marketing people at Bud Light thought they had a right to insert themselves into the middle of your conversation, number one, and number two, change the tone of your conversation and the content of your conversation, and they have no place at that table. They forget that. What they yeah. forget is why people drink beer. It's not about, and I know for some it is the alcohol, but for most people when you say, if hey, let's sit down and have a beer, it's a social. It's a social gathering. Thing, yeah. It's a discussion. It's a conversation. But you don't get, you and as the beer don't lead the discussion. You, you don't get to be right. the leader of that, and you don't get to tell me what my discussion is going to be with my buddies. 866 red eye Coming up, more with Gary McNamara and Eric Harley. It's Red Eye Radio. It's Friday Radio. He's Eric Carley, and I'm Gary McNamara. It's really incredible because you th- you think about it that uh, Max, which is HBO Max, mm-hmm. you know, they actually had the conversation. Look, we couldn't we couldn't make CNN Plus that streaming service succeed. So what we're going to do is, if you buy Max, you get CNN Plus. But if you're watching a movie on Max, we'll cut in with breaking headlines during a movie. There's a whole difference between free TV. You know, running a crawler underneath a movie stating the news is coming up at 11. You're not right. paying for it. When you're paying for it. Yeah, and they're going to break in. You don't want anything no. that you're not paying for. That's not going to work, by the way. Their customers will backlash. This is Red Eye Radio on Westwood One. Now, it's Red Eye Radio. Gary McNamara and Eric Harley talk about everything from politics to social issues and news of the day. Whether you're up late or you're just starting your day, welcome to the show. From the Uniden America Studios, this is Red Eye Radio. All across America and around the planet, we are Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Harley and I'm Gary McNamara. Just... Uh, reading some analysis, Eric, of the new, and they're going to call it, it's not going to be CNN Plus, it'll be CNN Max. If you remember, CNN tried a streaming service last year that, did it last a month? I think it was 14 minutes. I mean, <laughs> I'm reading this article here, it didn't last a news cycle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what's, what's happening is... Um, Right here, I'm reading from this website, 9 to 5 uh, uh, Mac. I just happened to see it. It was, it was funny. Now the marketing gurus behind the infamous HBO Max to just Max rebrand have a completely original idea. What if CNN had a streaming video product that a- wasn't actually CNN? CNN Max, which is totally not just CNN Plus, but from a new regime, launches in September. The difference this time is that it's not actually a standalone subscription, 
the 999 and up price tag actually refers to Max, formerly HBO Max, and included CNN Max is a feature within the big bundle of content, which is why we told you that the Variety Magazine, the National Review article talking about the fact that if you're watching a movie on Max, that you <laughs> there's breaking news from CNN Max, <laughs> your movie either will be interrupted or there'll be you know, a little crawl on it, you know, saying... You or know, a prompt on your screen or something. Prompt right? on your screen or something mm-hmm. like that while you're watching a movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, to be fair to CNN Max, which is different from CNN and the shortly lived CNN Plus, a new product might reflect more of what's on the cable channel than what Max subs- subscribers get now. Max subscribers will begin seeing CNN Max Live News, as it's officially called, starting September 27th. Max is already home to CNN Originals. The difference is that CNN Max will feature programming from the CNN and CNN International TV channels, plus original news coverage created just for Max. The custom schedule of CNN programming just for Max subscribers will likely change based on Max subscriber feedback. However, uh, so it's difficult to nail down exactly what CNN Max will ultimately become. Well, that's it. It, it goes back to the demand of the the for the uh, product itself. How many people are actually going to, you know, go there to watch it? Well, and I- if they're there, select that. Because, you know, you look at um, there are some live streaming apps from Fox News has one. ABC has one. And these are not from their main ch- channels or even their cable channels. They're separate. It's a, it's a streaming, and sometimes it's during an event and they're doing live coverage of an event or whatever it might be. But they don't have a ton of viewers there. Well, if you look at the subscription for you know any cable service where you have to pay extra, a premium, uh, Max is in that group, and then now you're going to add to it. All right. And and they're building this whole, you know, streaming site, uh, rebuilding this streaming site now to be like Paramount Plus and, and all the others. Except for the fact that it's so fragmented right now, even within that one streaming site, your choices are all over the place. What rises to the top? Usually it's the stuff that is big in theaters, big on TV, right. and already has a huge level of interest. CNN isn't that and has never been that. Well, there's – and even this analysis, well, we're not really sure what we're adding, so subscribe, spend nine ninety nine. Mm-hmm. Well, and as I mentioned earlier, when I when I went to uh, Max, when I, when I – uh, for a couple of months last year, it was for that specific movie of a Christmas story, mm-hmm. the new Chris. That's the only reason I went there because I knew exactly what the content was going to be. Mm-hmm. So paying whatever it was, I don't know if it was nine ninety nine last year or whatever, but whatever the price was, I said that's worth it for me to watch it. And then with the fam- when I go back and see the family, be able to cast it for them, that was worth the two months and the twenty bucks because everybody enjoyed it so much. And so I went, I got my money's worth. But once it was done, I might have kept it for another month, watched a bunch of old movies. I think they had on, uh, I think I watched the first 20 minutes of uh, So I Married an Axe Murderer, which you and I must, mm-hmm. it's like a must watch for either mm-hmm. of us. Mm-hmm. And other than that, then then I'm done with it. Right. Because I've seen all the movies, but I wanted that original content. Yeah. And I believe, I even, even though our job is unique and we're always looking at, at news, uh, I believe we're like most people where there are the specific things that we will pay for. For example, and I can't believe it because when you told me a couple of years ago you did it on uh, on YouTube mm-hmm. where you weren't paying for the commercials. Mm-hmm. Like, well, who pays to not get something? You know, I thought, oh, well, is it really? Well, it's the most wonderful thing in the world because yeah. I can watch yeah. so much content without any commercial interruption and content that regular people are making 
you know, from great, I mean, the number of bands I've discovered, mm-hmm. the number of, of documentaries that are there that you can specifically tailor to yourself, it is worth the 10 plus dollars a month uh, uh, for that because there's so much content that I can specifically pick. Mm-hmm. Well, number one, CNN free isn't getting anybody watching it. Exactly. So CNN two free, what do you expect to get? Because I, I'm, I say CNN two free because most people will probably be paying for the HBO Max and they're not even thinking about the CNN. Well, it's just like cable. They, they pay for cable or satellite. Right. And they're still not going. And if you think, if you break it down to the number of channels you get per channel, it's a few pennies. And they still don't go there. There's not this right. rush for the product. There's not a huge demand for the product. They're offering it for free. Well, free doesn't make it interesting. Free doesn't mean it's in well, demand. And and when they say, yeah, but you'll get CNN International News, I go, oh, the airport. Yeah. That's what I think. I'm like, I've seen it. It's boring. <laughs> I, I can go. I can go. I'll go to YouTube and find out what's going on. I can go. I can go straight to the BBC or Sky News if something's happening internationally, and well, probably if, get it better and 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 less of an agenda yeah. than CNN International. Well, again, it's so fragmented. How many different streaming uh, news sites? When yeah. there's breaking news, yeah. right? Oh, then you get into YouTube, and you go if you go to the news section of YouTube, and they'll post the story, whether it's from local news um, uh, stations or uh, national or international, and you can watch a number of stories uh, the, based on your own interest, based on what you're looking for. It's on demand. You're seeking it out. Offering it to me for free doesn't make it attractive. It's the content that makes it attractive. And this the specific content and and for breaking news, for example, you know, the the number of weather channels, I mean, Fox Weather, which is free. I don't have to go mm-hmm. to the weather. Fox Weather does a great job. Mm-hmm. And that's on free TV. Mm-hmm. It's on one of the local, you know, H D channels, which is just and it's as good to me, it's actually better than the Weather Channel. Mm-hmm. And I like their meteorologists and the way they explain things. Right. And they, they hooked me, what was it, last year with the Arkansas tornadoes? Mm-hmm. The way they covered those, I've never seen anybody cover it with such great specifics of radar. And they're pointing out, I mean, they're telling people, five, we talked about this yesterday, you know, five miles ahead, if you're at the intersection of this road and this road, you need to get out right now. Right. If you're in this tiny little town of 100 people, get out. It was, I mean, it was, it was intense. It was informative and it was as, it was as, perf- it's what you expect from meteorologists, you know, because it was following things, the actual tornado on the ground, mm-hmm. you know, so closely. And I'm like, you've got me, you've got me hooked because you presented me with something that was just greatness. It was right. great. Right. And, but, but then I think of breaking news, for example. On my free streaming channels, because I have them all now. I mean, I, living in Dallas may be a little bit different because there are so many, you know, uh, sub-digital channels. You mm-hmm. probably have, what, 80? Mm, 80, maybe, yeah. ch- yeah. 80 over-the-air channels. And then when I got my new LG TV, there's the LG TV channels. Then there's, uh, then there's Tubi, and there's Pluto, and there's Freebie. Again, it's severely fragmented. Yeah. Yeah, and but but in that, are all the, I think LG TV has it and Pluto has it, you have like, and I think, I don't know if it's, I don't know if NBC or CBS has it, or NBC or ABC has it, but it's like every CBS major market there is, which is a news feed from their news of every, like Dallas, Chicago, uh, San Francisco, whatever. And so if something happens, you can go directly to the local news. Mm -hmm. Well, that dilutes the value of CNN, a second CNN channel, Completely. Well, what are you there for? Our special programming. Well, it's going to be spin. I don't want to see. Right. That's my first thought. Right. And you haven't really told me what you're going to be doing yet because you don't even know what you're going to be doing yet. Well, they look, they there was this thought that they were going to be able to capitalize on the Netflix business model. This is what Paramount Plus and all of them were really trying to do. 
John Malone, who is with um, uh, Liberty Me- Liberty Media Company and and, uh, and which is part of the group that owns um, uh, Discovery, that owns CNN now and HBO. Well, you look at it, and he's a very smart man. Back in the day, he was talking about how Netflix did it on such a scale. If you look at the scale of Netflix globally, um, it's it's really mind boggling. Now it hasn't been perfect along the way. It was, in in fact, very imperfect for the longest time. And sometimes they run into their own main issues. But everybody was basing it on that. So you started seeing Disney pull things away from. Uh, other streaming sites and even on cable, even on their own channels, you know, they were like, okay, we're going to have certain content that is only going to be here at this one place, Disney Plus. We want to build this out so people pay separately for that. All right. So what's the key to that? The key element is children. Mm -hmm. All right. If you want to entertain your kids, all right, then we've got it here. That's part of the, uh, I think, benefit that people saw with netflix so all of the studios that were you know then paramount and all of them okay we have all of our own properties our own studios and properties that we can stream this is what we've got well paramount plus has been far less than perfect and is struggling and the reason is the churn rate it is fragmented, will always be fragmented, because even if you put it all under one house, well, there's still how many other streaming sources? And you can still find similar content somewhere else. And they find that, okay, I'll budget in like you did with Max. Okay, I want to watch this movie, or mm-hmm. I want to I want to watch this series. It's eight weeks long. Right. Okay, that's two months. I'll subscribe. Mm-hmm. The moment, the moment it hits, and then eight weeks later, I'm out. And they jump off. The churn rate is very high because people don't want to afford it. Now what they've done is gone into partnerships with, like, um, T-Mobile, which will pay yeah. your Netflix bill. Uh, Walmart Plus is paying, I forget which it is, Paramount Plus or something. And so, And then if you get a higher plan, at your cell phone carrier, they'll also throw in this one. Well, without those partnerships, I wonder where the demand for streaming would be. Because basically what they're saying is, okay, pay your cell phone bill, and it's all included. Well, that's the Amazon model. I'm going to pay Amazon for stuff I need to order. And I happen to be able to rent movies or (laughs) watch free movies or other content on Amazon Prime Video. Those are the things where you have to bundle it in a, in a different way. That's why Walmart Plus, and Walmart knew this. Look, we'll also throw in, if you get the Walmart Plus, which is uh, 100 bucks a year, then you're going to get these benefits on delivery of groceries and items and everything else. But, but, and you're going to get this streaming service thrown in. But even at 139 bucks, if you live in the society today where we're ne- we don't have to go to the store and mm-hmm. you can get it delivered immediately... There is such a value to that alone, even though at the yeah, pri- that, even, that, even, that, even even though at the price point, people are eventually going to start complaining because it's gone. I think initially from what seventy nine to like one thirty nine, mm-hmm. but still, it's such a deal for the convenience of having it at the door within a day or within hours. That's what Walmart is with, doing. With, they're, within they're hours, mimicking Amazon's where, plan, where it's like the Prime is like an extra bonus. And for example, I've, I've got T Mobile. Well, T-Mobile gives me free Wi-Fi now on all my airplane flights, every single one. Right. Well, you look at that on a normal flight, that's 19 bucks. Yeah. Every segment. Yeah. I I pay, for, my phone bill's paid for just visiting my dad and using Wi-Fi on the plane. Yeah. Walmart will bring groceries to my door within two hours if I want. But I guess you my pay for yeah. that convenience, right? And we but, and we love that. Convenience. But you're so satisfied with the convenience, yeah. You know that's and and you know the phone itself. I I think of when thirty years ago, thirty mm-hmm. thirty five years ago, I was paying two hundred bucks for my landline phone because I was living out of town and making so many long distance phone calls. Right. My phone bill's now sixty 
with a computer. Right. And and 5G. So mm-hmm. I view that as such a value compared to what it was 30 years ago. Maybe people that are younger can't make that same comparison. Right. But to me, I do. Mm-hmm. And then you're giving me free plain Wi-Fi. The whole right. thing seems like I'm sort of getting everything for free. That's yeah. the feeling you get. That's not what I'm getting with CNN+. Plus. I don't get that feeling. Or well, CNN well, Max. Well, no, it doesn't add anything to your right. life. It, it isn't improving it in any way. Content itself alone has to be outstanding to be attractive, yeah. not free. Like A Christmas Story 2. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 866 red eye Hi, I'm Jen Loomis, a transport safety expert at J.J. Keller, and I'm here to share a tip on roadside inspections. At a roadside inspection, inspectors may ask to see supporting documents. A supporting document is a document generated or received by a motor carrier in the normal course of business that can be used by law enforcement to verify a driver's logs. These documents can include bills of lading, itineraries, schedules, or equivalent documents that indicate the origin and destination of each trip. They can also include dispatch or trip records, expense receipts related to on-duty slash not driving periods, including receipts for meals, lodging, and fuel, electronic mobile communication transmitted through a fleet management system, and payroll records, settlement sheets, or equivalent documents that indicate payment to a driver. Drivers using paper logs must also keep toll receipts. Supporting documents must contain the driver's name, carrier assigned identification number or vehicle unit number that can be linked to the driver, the date, the name of the nearest city, town, or village, and the time. This tip was brought to you by J.J. Keller & Associates. Visit us at jjkeller.com. We'll be right back with more Red Eye Radio with Eric Harley and Gary McNamara. It's Friday Radio. He's Eric Carley, and I'm Gary Mack. And we started this discussion uh, from uh, a uh, National Review article, the companies that hate customers, talking about, uh, you know, what uh, Bud Light, uh, what Bud Light did, uh, and then talked about uh, Max, HBO Max, which is mm. going to add on CNN Max. And mm-hmm. it's just like, and, and the CNN Max may interrupt the, your paid streaming movie that you're watching mm-hmm. for breaking news. Mm-hmm. And it's just like you just shake your head going, wow, they're just, they're clueless. They really yeah, are. Right. They're just clueless. hours all night and still not enough listen to our podcast available on the app and on our website red i radio show.com and he's eric carly and i'm gary mcnamara and uh, just a, well, a final thought because uh, i was thinking about the story out yesterday uh, not only comparing what's going on at, at uh, Ma- hbo max to the whole bud light situation and the article companies that hate their their, their customers but just the whole thing you know we couple weeks ago it was kid rock it was drinking a bud light but then the numbers coming out again bud light's not improving at all still right yeah. it's a disaster area and i started thinking the other day and i forgot to talk about it on the air could you imagine if we did what bud light did i mean just just uh transport that to the radio business think about it you know, like what you were you, saying about listeners during the break <laughs> would never ever ever be on the airwaves well, well, well let's well, actually, I'll, I'll I'll say it. What it would be like? It'd be like almost saying, you know, you you Trump supporters, you DeSantis supporters. I mean, you you Republican conservatives, you all, all of you radio you, listeners, all, all you all you radio <laughs> listeners. You know, you're you know you're you're a bunch of uh, of your your fraternity mindset. 
<laughs> your frat mindset. Bunch of you know, we, we frat need, boys. A bunch of frat boys. And we blue need, collar people. You bunch of red. You bunch of redneck, <laughs> redneck, red state hicks. Mm. You know, we, we we need to move on. We're you know we 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 need to expand and see if we can get that Hillary voter to listen. I mean, seriously. Yeah. That's what. That's, no, that, what that's it, was, it. That's what it's like saying. <laughs> It is when you have to put it in some type of perspective. <laughs> no, I mean that's exactly it. And then and then going, I can't believe that marketing idea failed. Yeah, right. what happened? How, how did that marketing idea failed? Right, you insulted your audience. You know, and 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 that's it. We, <laughs> God, people are so stupid. I mean, it's just. We we are just I mean it's just we're we're just we're surrounded by stupid every day because that was forget about politics forget about anything else you're in marketing you're in branding a beer yeah yeah I mean I mean it's just but there's there's something that's generational and some of it's not generational some of it is that. That woke mindset. Listen, we need to be something different. We need to be a champion for some reason. Well, you're a beer, and you're doing very well, in fact, as a beer. I mean, you're really killing it out there in the marketplace. Now, we've seen all of the corporate pandering, the you know, trying to, and now that's, in fact, Bud Light Marketing has kind of gone gone back to that like hey we're we're about the handshake and hard work <laughs> in our books a handshake is just as good as a contract and by the way yes that is an american flag behind me thank you very much <laughs> and it's like and it's and as you're shaking hands for the yeah. deal you're handing the other very masculine guy well <laughs> a beer <laughs> and, and by the way we want to remind you the founder of our competitor's brand was named Adolf. We're just going to leave it right there. <laughs> you know, it's it, and it's been done before. The pandering thing you can kind of see. Hopefully. But when you when you really, really screw up and then try and go back to the pandering, it's like, mm, yeah, no, we're still out. It's... um. And, and this and, is and, different. And when, and, and when you think about it, because the, what 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 I think one of the most one of the most important, probably best ads they ever did was the Clydesdale. Remember after nine eleven? Yeah. Right. Yeah. That was. I well, I just got chills. Yeah, I, just, no. I just got goosebumps from that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, now, don't sell beer that way. I get goosebumps drinking your beer. Right. <laughs> probably, no, but that that ad was so that ad was. And the, Incredible that I would the the um the Dodge trucks ad uh, Super Bowl ad uh, and I think it was God made a farmer I think it's from yeah the, yeah mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. the old Paul Harvey a very uh, well known Paul Harvey piece that was used as the voiceover a friend of mine was involved uh, part of the ad agency that that put that together and it was the one that was like whoa wow that that was a great ad right um. But when when you see some, and there are a lot of people in advertising now that have the same mentality that we've talked about in, in Hollywood where they're sitting down to, you know, green light a movie or not or project or whatever, and they're saying, well, why is it important to make this movie now? Oh, I have a word. Profits. <laughs> and... Well, that's the only answer. It's any, it's, any, it any, is, what is the demand? Right. Any societal benefit that comes from that is fine. Yeah. And there is a lot of societal benefit that comes. There's a ton of societal benefit that comes from profit making companies yeah. every single day. Right. And, and that's, you know, there, there is the, you know, the one thing uh, we go back to, uh, Taffer, you know, John Taffer, Bar Rescue. Mm -hmm. You're selling a legal drug. People are coming here to drink a legal drug. And and a limited number of licenses are given out 
for this legal drug. Yeah. How the hell can you can't you be making a profit? Well, and, and <laughs> you know, for a Bud Light, you've got a relatively cheap legal drug. Yeah. That is doing very well in 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 its category. That has immersed itself into society. You know, the successful beer companies have immersed themselves as part oh yeah of a, a part a, a, how, and and you put it you know the a, a, a part of the of the the get the, the 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 culture of gathering mm-hmm. together right. as a group of people right. to communicate to uh to to talk to become friends for for families yeah. you know they and you may say it's just alcohol we're talking about how they've marketed it successfully and what it's to, become and and what it's become and the image that has been portrayed by it. And, was, it and it's because the image they're portraying is not you're getting you're getting drunk. No. That's no. not that's not the image they're, they're portraying. It's the gathering of people. You know, you you mentioned it, you know, business deals, you know, shaking your it, you know, sh- uh, shake hands means something. I could see that as an ad. You shake your hands, mm-hmm. you you're you know, there's farm equipment all over the place. And I don't care whether you live in a city or you live in a rural area. That reverberates with everybody. You know, we're the kind of people, you know, we, we don't need to sign a contract. Our word is good enough. We shake hands. We take you, a shower at you, the end of the day. We, do, You know, these are the right, things that, yeah. Exactly. But when you're shaking hands for the deal and, you know, tipping your cowboy hat at them, mm-hmm. you hand them a beer. Mm-hmm. And that's the whole thing of it's about, it's about, you know, communication. It's about you know, people coming together. It's about business deals that that uh, that profit both sides of it. And it can be set in a rural setting, as many beer commercials are, or a party setting, or a boating setting, whatever. But the imagery is universal, whether you live well, in cities or whatever. And, that's why it's that, been successful. And that's it. I mean, people don't drink beer because they're thirsty. <laughs> they They drink it out of an emotion. Yeah, you're right. Consolation. Relief after a long day or a hard day. Celebration. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Camaraderie. Camaraderie. And you think of the emotions that drive the demand for the product. And you decided you were going to take it and make it something else. And then it wasn't even just that. It was your response to it. When you decided that your customer base needed to be purged, frat boys. You know, there's also the the, the beer commercials that have used women. Mm-hmm. I remember, remember it was SNL that did the gay one. Yeah, remember the gay right. beer, the yeah, gay yeah, pool, yeah. Pool, par- pool, yeah. <laughs> pool party one. To, right. But really, the the whole thing, I, I don't. I don't sense that has been a focus of beer companies over the last decade like it might have been. Not that it's completely eliminated. For example, if you're having a party, they're going to have attractive women there. But it, it just seems like that. Well, uh, when, 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 I, when I was, uh, when this all happened and I saw Troy Aikman do those commercials to sell his Elite Eight beer mm-hmm. and talk about the fact that his beer is made in America. A lot of people talk about patriotism in their beers. My beer's made in America. We're not going to talk about anything else except you getting together with family and friends. I mean, we had said that, and then when he did the commercial, I'm like, was he listening to our show that night? And I'm no, I he probably was not. But it's he knows how to sell beer. That's how you sell beer. Yeah. Right. And and so for them to get into the situation they did, because you actually and that's why when I saw this the companies that hate their customers, and that's why I went well, how would you relate it if we tried if we tried what Bud Light did on our show? Well, you're committing economic suicide. You'd be insulting, as we just did, I think. Uh, pretty successfully, we gave an example of how you insult your listeners. <laughs> right. Well, you know, it's one thing. Um, Target. And they decided they were going to oh. go, you know, and, and build essentially their own march inside their aisles, in, inside their store. Yeah. Inside their selection. If you wanted to take that Target brand and go to a march and people saw that, you know, somewhere else outside of the shopping experience, that would have been very different. But when 
you did it and then it was handled the way it was handled after going through the whole thing with the restroom thing before that and not learning, then what you're doing is you're interrupting the experience of your customer and there's absolutely no reason to do that. That's a disruption in the process of them purchasing. They're there voluntarily purchasing things. You've already got them in the store. They have a cart and now they're gone. When you disrupt that, you've done it again. It's not like they said, hey, we're going to sponsor this event and you take banners out there. That would have been a very different thing. You're talking about changing the experience for people inside, inside of a store. store. Right. That's very different. And when that is done, expect that there's going to be a response by the consumer. And this is what you're seeing here. You know, back in the day, Coke learned the hard way. Nobody uh-huh. wanted new Coke. There was no demand for, hey, you better change this. No. What they saw was their competitor was getting some market share. Pepsi was gaining. And they were like, oh, we got to do something. Uh, what are we going to call it? Uh, Copsy? And that's horrible. New Coke. Okay, that's great. Which was also horrible. Coxy. I mean, <laughs> Coxy. Coxy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sounds like Pepsi. <laughs> Let's go back to old Coke. Let's put the Coke yes. back in Coke. Classic. <laughs> Coca Cola. Classic. Coca Cola classic. <laughs> yeah. Like classic. No. Now you sound like my grandfather. No. no it just <laughs> I just want Coca Cola. Now that might sell though. But, you know, but put the Coke back in Coke. Yeah. The way that it used to be. Well, then a little they bit learned, of opium. Then Coca Cola learned. Oh, wait a minute. Um, we can also have other other drinks that we offer as a as a company right. under the under the brand. We can mm-hmm. we can have uh, bottled water and energy drinks and. And, uh, you know, some of the uh, Diet Coke, Coke Zero. I mean, it's a yeah, you know, sure. And Coke and Zero other, is a big seller for them, and, isn't it? And and far beyond sodas, you know, so they yeah. so let's just, you know, expand the field that way. Oh, OK. Maybe we get more shelf space by offering different products, not changing the product that people love. But at least Coke didn't initially go out and say, look, we believe our Coke drinker today is a moron. We're trying to find new. Exactly. <laughs> you say to do that. You people have it. All you people that make us number one, you're wrong. You're idiots. <laughs> well, that's exactly what Bud Light said. I know. All these morons that keep buying our beer. <laughs> we we got we got to find new markets and. Well, well, that's it. We're so tired of the type of people that buy our beer. You mean the ones that pay for it? That. Hand their money over willingly and repeatedly? Those people? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We've got to Horrible. Ins- We've got to insult them. Let's hope they don't buy the beer. Well, you don't have to ask that. Coming up next, we have something to say about radio listeners. <laughs> 866 red <laughs> Coming up, more with Gary McNamara and Eric Harley. It's Red Eye Radio. Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Carley, and I'm Gary McNamara. It looks like the uh, the what would be the eye of the tropical storm, mm. Adelia, now off the uh, the, uh, the the coast of uh, South Carolina. Yeah, right now, and you see a lot of rain in North Carolina, and a lot of the real heavy rain. Mm. Uh, even just looking at the current weather map right now, which is uh, all the way up into uh, you know North Carolina and parts of Virginia, mm. almost reaches. Richmond, just south of Richmond, ah. not north of Richmond, mm. south of Richmond. <laughs> this is Red Eye Radio on Westwood One. <laughs> 